website. Good afternoon. Welcome again. The, uh, the middle part of the closing extravaganza. So we had a, we had a fantastic opening section from ChronoZoom. Um, we're going to segue straight into our uh, final keynote from Professor Spear. And then a reminder straight after that, we'll set these chairs up here on the stage. And it's just a Q&A discussion, conversation about the conference, big history, uh, re remarks from Fred. Fred's not going to take questions at the very end of his uh, talk. We'll save those for part of the collective discussion at the very end. Um, uh, Fred, of course, is from the University of Amsterdam. He's one of the true pioneers of big history. Um, he's a author of several great books on big history. His most recent book, Big History in the Future, has been extremely important to me in my class with my students. And I know there's sort of a textbook version of that book uh, in the works and plan too, which I'm very excited about. Uh, as of about two, three days ago, Fred is now the, uh, the president of the International Big History Association. Yeah. Going to offer his thoughts now on the future of big history. So please welcome Professor Fred Spear. Uh, thank you very much. But before I start uh, sharing with you my thoughts about the future of big history, first a few words about the recent past. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, Dominican University of California for the most wonderful hosting of this conference. Thank you for having I would like to thank in particular the President Mary Marcy, the Provost Stephen Weisler, and the Assistant Provost Moshkan Bemon, who basically done the heavy, heavy lifting of this uh, organizing here, up together with Jill Thomas, and four outstanding students who many who you've seen them here in the hallway uh, all the time. So thank you so much. Stand up for Project and Provozoom for the most generous uh, support. Uh, and within IBHA, the program committee also have done extraordinary amount of work, led magnificently by Lowell Gustafson. Where's Lowell? There he is. Absolutely. Uh, there's also been uh, the conference organization team, uh, well, who else but Craig, I would say, and his wife Pam, and Donna too from our IBHL office. Could you all stand up? Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank all of you who have come here to share in this adventure, this great conversation about how we would see our grand past. It's been a wonderful time. I think we've had many most stimulating conversations. I hope we'll continue in whatever form in the future. And that brings me to today's subject, the future of big history. Well, the first thing, if you think about the future of big history, it will be embedded of the future of humanity. No doubt about that. So let's first devote a few words of how we could look at the future of humanity seen also from the perspective of the recent past. And for doing so, I have developed a number of slides that I call our shrinking earth. And I'll explain why I call it that way. This is the full earth as photographed by the astronauts of Apollo 17, the last Apollo mission to the moon in December of 1972. It's known as the blue marble, as many of you may know. And the question I would pose is how big would the Earth look like in history if we factored in human population growth? That means how much surface would there be available for a human on the Earth? A very simple question, and I'll show you how you can do that. So here we are in 2014 with 7 billion people on the planet. Now let's go back in time a little bit, just to 1990, more or less when big history started is 5 billion on the planet. Well, if you calculate the amount of people, let's say the amount of surface available for people, the Earth starts to become bigger. There was simply more surface per person available, right? Now we go back to 1960. 
I was already around it. Quite a few of us were around it. I learned at school that there were 3.5 billion people on the planet. So it was considerably bigger, right? It's in our lifetime, at least. People more or less my age. Now we go back to 1900, the Industrial Revolution in full swing. 1.8 billion people. Or we go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. 1 billion people. Now we go back to, let's say, 1500, when Europeans have more or less first gone to colonize the Americas, 500 million people. So that's the time of Columbus and friends, I would say. <laughs> anyway, um, now we go back to the period, let's say, the Roman Empire and the Han Empire, both in full swing, 250 million people. Well, it's become pretty big already in just 2,000 years. Well, now we have to make a switch what if, let's say, 2,000 years ago is just as big as here, lower that, right? Otherwise, you can't fit it on the screen anymore. Yeah. So now we go back to, let's say, the beginning of state formation, more or less. 50 million people, roughly. Earth was considerably bigger. Now we go back to the beginning of agriculture. The Earth was, again, considerably bigger. And that makes one wonder. How, was, how big was the Earth when modern humans appeared on the scene? Well, hard to calculate, we don't know exactly how many were, but it's off the screen, right? You cannot put it on the screen anymore. Okay, that is only population growth. Now we come to ask the question, how big would the Earth look like if we also factored in decreasing natural resources? I cannot calculate that exactly. The other ones, I made very precise calculations, so that is more or less okay, but this is more of a guess, I would say. But let's try it. So here we start 2,000 years ago with this size. 1,500, 1,800, 1,900, 1,960, 1,990, 2014. So we see it shrinking both because of population growth and both because of decreasing natural resources. Now, now we can pose the question, what can we expect for the future? What will it look like? Well, there we go. So what can we expect? Here again, 9 billion in 2050. Earth is considerably big, smaller again. Or this. And this would mean some kind of catastrophe, right? Big die out. That's what it would be. And it could have been caused by diseases, by nuclear war, or whatever. Other misery, hunger. So, if we want to think about the immediate future, which we, as a my age group, people may not see, but our children and grandchildren certainly will see, this is what we need to think about. And this will also be the context of big history in the future. A sobering thought. Anyway, now on a lighter note. Um, I'm going to take you back to the origins of our own big history course in Amsterdam. We started in 1994 uh, in this building. It's called the Oude Manhuispoort, the Old Man's Gate. Uh, in, over here in this lecture hall. And we walk in here, out there, go around that little green field. Um, and this is what it looked like at the time. As you can see, time has not stood still. It's quite an effort. This is me at the, the publication of the university weekly. And this is us, my supervisor, Joan Houtkom, and me uh, during our first course. And to get an idea of what was, where it was, we were walking along two statues, sort of hidden in the bushes here. Oh, nice guys. What are these guys? I'll magnify them a little bit. Perhaps you can read it already, but I'll make it more clear. The names are Fossius and Bartheus, and I'm sure virtually none of you have ever heard of them. Just like none of our university students in Amsterdam have ever heard of them. We just walked past them and had no idea what these guys are doing there. Um, so let me tell you a little about them. 
the university was founded in 1632 in Amsterdam. It couldn't be called a university because Leiden had already a university and therefore Amsterdam was not allowed to have its own university. It was simply too close. So they called it something else, Ateneum Illustre, and they started anyway. Now, the first lecture, the introductory lecture, was given by one of these guys, Gerard Fossius, and it was about the usefulness of history. It was all in Latin, of course. Latin was the, let's say, intellectual language, just like English is today, I would say. Um, so we all had, all, they all had to speak Latin, just like all of us had to speak English today. Now, what happened to this lecture? Virtually nothing. Totally forgotten. <laughs> so, that, that is a sobering lesson again, I would say. Um, but it was another guy who gave a talk, that was the other guy, the second guy on the statue, Casper Marlage. You can see he's a bit more of an entrepreneur in his eyes, right? This, this guy looks like a good scholar, very serious scholar, this was more of a, And he gave a talk about the Mercator Sapiens, that means the wise merchant. So he was basically flattering the element of the city in Amsterdam, who had found a university, put up with some money to get the talk started and invited these guys. So he decided, okay, I'll flat it down and give a nice talk. And what happened to that one? It's still very much alive. As you can see, it's an organization that sells university merchandise right now. It's so, right, it's still there. So there's a lesson here, again, that you shouldn't only think about the usefulness of history, it may also make sense to flatter your sponsors. Right? <laughs> that may actually be a very important part of the situation. Anyway, um, so at the time I would say that for more educated people, they were very much connected to earth and heaven. They were basically going around the world, crossing the seas, they used navigation, and in order to live well, they had to observe the stars and the sun, and learn the rules about everything. Here you see is such a navigational manual, the Mariner's Bitter, Bitter, which was more or less a copy of what was earlier produced by Portuguese uh, sailors and, and, and uh, navigators. But the Dutch were smart merchants and they basically sold all across Europe in different languages, which the Portuguese didn't for some reason. Um, so people were, in their daily life, were very much connected to the sky. And this kind of education actually continued to exist in Holland until the 1940s. My dad still had cosmography as a subject in secondary school. It has now disappeared. But at the time, it was taught to all kids so they could become good navigators and they knew about the sky. Right? And that, that was lost actually. Uh, and also, let's say, Amsterdam Town Hall, they built a very proud town hall from the 1650s, now the Royal Palace. And what you see there on the floor are big maps of the earth and the sky. So the Amsterdam burghers actually could walk literally on top of the world and on top of the sky. That's the kind of thing they were doing at the time. That's the prior image of bringing in all this wealth from around the world and with the aid of uh, all this, uh, this new knowledge. And that was part of it of map making, right? The Dutch were at the time probably among the best map makers of the world. They produced their world maps. That was also a good business. They sold these maps to rich people. They were among the most expensive gifts that were given to ambassadors, kings, queens, and some of them have still been preserved in the library of the University of Amsterdam. So I would say that given the new situation we find ourselves in, what we need to do is some new kind of map making. That's already been argued by David that the need for big history and focusing is a similar argument. So I didn't, I, by the way, I didn't change any of my slides of this presentation. I made it all before the conference started, but what I found is that they actually tie in quite nicely with some of the presentations. So that, that made me very happy when I heard it happening. Um, so what we basically need to do is make maps of time and space, I would say, in order to confront a new situation, just like the Dutch did in the 17th century, the Dutch and others, in order to navigate across the seven seas. 
right? So that is the usefulness of big history, I would say. Now I'll tell you a little more about our big history course. This is a picture from our first course in 1994. You see our anthropologist John de Vos explaining human evolution and brought basically a big plastic bag with casts of skulls, put them on the table, show them, try to move them around, okay, you can make it the family tree like this, you can also do it like that. You know, that's a very, very nice uh, 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 way of presenting it. And we also had a lecture by Jona Obersky, and this is what he had to say. What you notice is self-organizing an anti-hierarchical network is growing. This computer uses as nerve nodes within the nerve system, the internet in the world. Right? And he told us there are things like websites, where you could actually go to. The White House had a website, you could actually visit that. Right? That, was the, that is the ancient history of our big history course. Now, what does it look like 20 years later? Here you see John Voss again lecturing, this was last year. He now, of course, used the PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure. It's always progress, I have to say. And I certainly like this early style very much as well. But, of course, there is the enormous technological change that has taken place during the history of our big history course, only 20 years. So, this is the situation you find yourself in today, I would say. There's information instantly available on all aspects of big history. You just type it in on whatever search engine and you find really a lot. You find all these YouTube movies, documentaries. We have easy contacts with scholars worldwide. When we were starting, email had just started. But how many people actually had an email account? Very few. Right? Just so we wrote letters and we put them in the mail. That's how we did it, even with our own lectures. Um, now, so that's a, a complete change. And now we may think that even that email is old fashioned, right? Because we prefer to text or whatever else we're doing. Um, there's the big history project now online. With all the resources available, of course, all the, all the online courses that are available, including the new crash course in the history that's being produced. So this is an entirely different landscape, so to speak, that we find ourselves in, and that raises the question: What can we do with the history compared to what we could do 20 years ago? 20 years ago, it was really new; it was still something very exciting, new. But today, with all this information, it is not as new anymore. It is. So what can we do in, in the future? Right? What is our strength? What can we do in a situation where transdisciplinary cooperation has become very common? It was not common at all 20 years ago. Now everybody's talking about it. In whatever form, I don't know what it means quite often, but at least it exists as a very important goal. So what can we add to that in big history? That's the question I posed, and I have a few answers here. But before I give you the answer, I want to underline that I'm talking as an IBHA representative, and we have to keep in mind our article of incorporation that it's about basically the scholarly pursuit of teaching and researching big history. That's all it's about. That's our, uh, that's our mission statement. And that is what I'm going to talk about. Because I'm talking about the future of the history as an IBHA enterprise. So what is the strength of the history? What is it that we can do that others cannot do? Well, first of all, and it's, it's pretty common, but it's important to just underline it again, I think. We can put all our knowledge on one single timeline. It's organized. When you see a book or an article or a movie, you can always so, okay, that's where it fits on the timeline. And you have a structure that helps you to orient yourself. Extraordinarily important. When I started studying chemistry in the 1970s, I was walk into a bookstore, and I was completely overwhelmed by all the books I saw because I had no idea why it was ordered the way it was and how it would all fit together. Now I know. I don't know what's all in all these books, but at least I know where they could be placed. Right, so it's extraordinarily important. We have also now been developing some sort of an integrated theoretical approach. I'm not going to say that we've 
reach the end, certainly not. I see it rather as a first beginning of a long and hopefully very interesting discussion of how to look at history in some co coherent, theoretical, integrated way. But we've come already quite a long way. When we started the history in 1994, we produced a syllabus with articles that we had selected about the different topics. There was no coherent whatsoever other than that you could put one time in. And now we can actually think about themes like energy flow, matter flows, complexity, and all these things that we've developed as common concepts. I'm not going to say this is the last word on it, but at least we have some kind of an overview in terms of concept that helps you to simplify the whole picture enormously, extraordinarily important. Because then you can make a selection of what you need to know, what you may perhaps not need to know. In the beginning, I felt I had to read everything. Now, that's a totally impossible, totally overwhelmed. So all this literature, play tectonics, on astronomy, on climate, or whatever. So how do you make a selection of what you find useful and not? And I think our theoretical framework helps us to make such choices, but makes us also aware of things that may not fit. So you can find things, perhaps, that perhaps may not fit the framework, and you can think about how would we fit that in, or perhaps would we need to change the framework? As long as you're sensitive to such things, I think an intellectual framework is not a bad thing. Uh, then, you, as we've seen, you can zoom in and zoom out for history. That this, for instance, is the age of chromosome. And that is extraordinarily useful. No other approach to history or no other academic discipline can do that. So if you follow, if you've taken a big history course, you have some idea of the zooming in and zooming out where you want to go if you want more information about a specific subject. And as a result, you can decide, okay, I have a specific problem that I want to solve. I look at all these different phases. Is there something that could help me to solve the problem? Cherry picking from this, 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 and that. And you combine it into some kind of hopefully interesting new analysis. And only people who are doing big history can do that. Because you have an overview of the whole thing. Right? So that is this, what I consider the strength of big history. And it's a considerable strength. But what is required to do that, because you're dealing with all these different disciplines, is intercultural communication. Not only among all the different people of the globe, that is also extraordinarily interesting and important, and I'm very much looking forward to an intensive discussion with people from many different countries about how they would view big history, what they would think is important, what kind of things they would put in or leave out. Uh, that's very interesting, and also how they would phrase it, their emphasis on certain things. I mean, that's going to be a wonderful discussion, but there's also going to be an honor discussion which may sometimes be very difficult to make the discussion among the disciplines. And that is also a theme that has been mentioned several times in this conference, the idea of the two cultures, this famous lecture given by C.P. Snow in Cambridge. Here you see a picture of the state uh, hall, the Senate hall, where he gave his talk in Cambridge. I took this picture in last February when we were invited to give a talk here at this college, this uh, Keyes College. Um, so it was very useful because I could say, you know what, there has been the separation of cultures, and this guy spoke about it just across the street. That was very nice. Uh, and on the other side, across the street, there's Cambridge University Press. Here you would feel, still find at least two different editions of that uh, lecture available. So I thought of that. And the idea is that, uh, let's say, the hard sciences look down on the humanities because they it's, it's basically a big mess. And I, uh, you don't really want to get involved with that because you, you can only get hurt, basically. Because you don't know enough that people start to criticize you as soon as you get some of their facts wrong. So why would you want to bother, right? Uh, and at the same time, these, uh, at the same time, in the humanities, they think, well, these, these, these hard sciences, they have no interest in literature or fiction or poetry. 
they are just interested in their hard science, so they're completely illiterate, actually, right? <laughs> Uh, so they look down. That is the point he was making, uh, and he then said something like, "Well, I sometimes ask some of these these scholars the question, but do you know what the second law of thermodynamics is?" Uh, and those, and then he said, "Well, the response was cold, but it was also negative. In other words, they had no clue." But he said, "Well." But it's important to realize that the second law of thermodynamics is just as important to the natural sciences as the work of Shakespeare in literature, right? So that pointed to some very important differences in perception and way of dealing. And I think to a considerable extent these differences still exist and we need to bridge them. We need to bridge them and a major problem may be that we may be using words, the same words, but with different meanings. Especially the word meaning is such a word. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because the natural science is the meaning of that means there must be God or a goal or whatever. So, while in, we've just seen that David and Cynthia and Craig see meaning in a very different way, just what kind of motivations it produces. So, and you can really start an extraordinary battle over the word meaning, but if you don't know what the other person means with the word meaning, then it's not going to be very fruitful. And this is just one example. There are so many words that, and so many assumptions about each other that may be totally wrong. I spent part of my life in the natural sciences, I spent part of my life in the social sciences history, and I've been truly amazed by differences and actually did the totally wrong perceptions quite often of each other. That, but we could talk a long time about that, I don't want to do that now, but it's, I think this is certainly something that we will have to face in the future with great carefulness. So I would suggest that as soon as you find yourself fighting with an academic from another discipline over a word, step back and think about what you're fighting about. And you may be fighting about something that simply is, has a different meaning. Uh, people discussing it. Anyway, um, so that I think is part of the future, and I hope it will lead to a very interesting discussion and perhaps a new vocabulary. And as a part of this, we want to foster all these worldwide discussions about the history, and we want to give you some idea of what's going to happen. But what we are seeing, I think, is that we are seeing the emergence of perhaps the first globally accepted version of history, at least among urban people. That's what we may be seeing, and as a result, we can have these discussions, just like, and sort of maybe, maybe in the making some kind of a history, just like there is chemistry or biology, and it hasn't been the case yet. Until now, it's been local histories, regional histories, perhaps world history, but even world history is not like this, world history, in, let's say, the World History Association here in America is viewed with some suspicion in Europe because they think it's too much focused on this country. So there's now a different World History Association. Now, that is something we would like to avoid. There may be different versions of big history, but I would like to, to be in discussion with each other. And I don't think any country should be seen as having a better solution than the other. We should all try to see what we can learn from each other. And, and if we do that, I think we may be forging one global big history. Now, what is happening in Russia, for instance, they've been truly supported from the very beginning, when there are no places in Western Europe or the United States where we publish big history articles, they did it. We could go to conferences and present big histories presentations. It was, and not only we could do it, it was received very well. Eh? So I, I really appreciate the Russians. They really helped us to get going and still help us. And they've produced a wonderful set of publications. Right? And also in China, Sun Yue is, is doing these things now in the Global uh, History Review, where he's produced recently Unfortunately, you can read it because it's in Chinese, but that's my problem, not their problem. Uh, a series of articles of, let's say, let's call them Westwood scholars, in lack of a better word, 
uh, and Chinese scholars discussing their works. I really hope that there will be a way to translate the things in the future, but that's absolutely wonderful. Right? That is part of the starting discussion. Also, Sun made sure that there was an interview in their leading uh, day, the following day, that according to him, read by many, many influential people. So that may actually help to change the mindset of Chinese leaders, and at least they may start thinking about it. So that's fantastic work. Uh, and Barry Rodriguez is currently working with Andre Kurotai and Leonid Klinin, also with Big History Publication in India, in Delhi, New Delhi. So that may help us to get going in India. And I understand that the H2 um, history, Big History movie series was also uh, aired in uh, India. I, I, I'm pretty sure that got for the first uh, episode, they invited me to do a live a Twitter uh, feed with people from India, so they could ask me questions and then respond. And that was kind of neat. So that was a great enthusiasm there. So I think there's a lot more happening, and there are many interested, many players, and much of it is going on on the internet. Uh, so what would we do as IBHA would certainly stimulate it. I'm not really sure what we could do other than the conferences, websites, discussion sites, but perhaps there's a lot more we can do. So all suggestions are welcome. Please help us get this discussion going and growing. That if you now focus on teaching and research, those are going to be the last subjects of my talk. Um, basically, of course, we have to support a big history project with the grant initiative, but I would also like to see an open discussion about what they've been doing, what the limitations are, what the strengths are, so that we can all learn from it. But I think that's important. It should not become some kind of a canon that sets the stage for big history. I think it should be an open discussion, like everything else, including my book, I see that as a, yeah, a discussion piece, not as a final work in any way, it will never be a final work, it's just a piece of discussion, as the beautiful ongoing discussion of how to do our grand past, right? Uh, we can learn a lot more, I'm sure, of what's been happening here at Dominican, so I would like to see ways of connecting to Dominican and learn from them in a more systematic fashion. I don't know how you would do that, but it's certainly like that. Uh, of course, big history courses worldwide. There can be many different big history courses. Big history project provides a model, but there are many other models possible, including the famous MOOCs, of course. But there could also be courses in lots of local and regional languages. I'm not so sure that the history project is going to be translated into other languages soon, but you may think of smaller scale course models that are being translated, so that you can help people to get going. Right? Also, given that it's going to be, and it's, yeah, it is a uh, high school project, of course, we will get students at universities who are already well first in big history. So what are we going to do at universities? We have to do something else, something more than that. So we have to develop advanced big history courses, right? And we may introduce a wider range of teaching tools, and perhaps more advanced big history theories. That's all part of what can be done. And I'll give you some idea of what we could do that is being done, is being done already in other teaching settings, but I think we could incorporate that systematically in the history. For example, I'm now experimenting in class with students doing experiments, preferably with outcome unknown, because then it's a real experiment, right? Or if not, it's a demonstration experiment. If the outcome is unknown, then it's interesting. So I basically send them out, go find as many species as you can within 500 meters of the building, right? and come back with results, and let's compare that with other, what other groups find, and what kind of biodiversity can we find in near our building. Uh, that's just one example, uh, but there are many examples possible. 
we can also highlight certain topics with, I would say, greater significance. You can pick whatever you want in work mark. Some spots you can make them observe spots, but you can do it easily with a tripod and a binocular as a piece of paper. You can observe your own sunspot. You can get very excited about it. And we can talk about it. You can also think about world fairs. Here's an example that I did last spring. Basically posing the question, why is there only one Eiffel Tower? And why are there so many Ferris wheels? And why is it that the original Eiffel Tower is there, while well, the original Ferris wheel is completely gone? And probably very few people know where it once stood. And what does it have to do with that period in time? They were both symbols of the Industrial Revolution. They were part of World Fairs, the showcases, the Paris International Exhibition. And this one was actually built as competition to compete with the Eiffel Tower at the Chicago Columbian World Fair. Um, so if you start exploring that, and what happened at these world fairs as part of the Industrial Revolution, the growing power, the growing possibilities, then you get to do a very interesting story. Uh, just one example. Many examples are possible. And you can let the students explore that. Of course, that, that and this, almost endless range of things can do. Now, let's go quickly move on to big history of research. Uh, basically, you can ask the students to do a small research project as part of the course. Let them come up with the inventory of, let's say, energy flows or matter flows in a subject of their choice. For example, their own hometown, their own country, throughout history. And put it all in a database. So that when we do the next course, we have already a database, students do another subject and build, that, build up that database. Can we connect to other courses in the world where they may do similar things so we can form a combined database? And you can do these general things of the energy and matter flows and the Goldilocks circumstances. I mean, that is an endless of course. You know, just, these are all huge research projects. We don't have any money for it. But in this way, we can get going and perhaps get very interesting results which may convince universities to actually support them and give us some money to do it. Um, so you can do that in cooperation with other so universities, other courses. It's a form of crowdsourcing, I think, and it, it may work. So I'm going to start it uh, this fall and see what happens. Uh, and you can look basically any themes that students come up with. Let, let it all happen and see what happens. I mean, it could be very exciting, of course, the big history, the little big history to play a role there. Anything that may seem reasonable, we could try, and then we could discuss that with perhaps students with other courses, we could set up systematic links, perhaps, so we could form the networks. Lots of things are possible here. Uh, so, of course, in the situation of PhDs are very difficult because there are very few big history positions in the world where we actually can accept PhD students, hardly any money for it, but you can try to forge coalitions with teachers, supervisors from other departments. That's what we're doing in Amsterdam. So, basically, they do a bit of the heavy lift, and as long as you get them interested, it may work. So we're forming these coalitions now with interested scholars from different departments. And we hope that it may lead to some kind of a successful model. Uh, so possible themes, I mean, it will not really surprise you. It's like the general themes in big history, as I just mentioned, a little bit history. Uh, you can think about history of big history, you can think about pedagogy of big history, and I think a lot more is possible. But well, these are general themes for which big history research makes sense to me. So it's not a lack of an agenda that we have, it is more that we lack institutional support, and that's because that it is part of the department. So we know that. Um, but I would say this is not only valuable for universities, it is probably also going to be useful for businesses, for governments, and perhaps for independent institutions, because you can say, okay, you have this problem, why is this not working? What is it that you would like to get accomplished? 
can we use big history as a tool to look at it from different angles, systematically? We do the cherry picking from our business analysis, combining these things, and here's the solution that we have to offer. It may or may not work, we haven't really tried it yet, but I do think there's considerable potential. Um, so I think there are many, many goals, but I think one general goal, and it is basically we have to keep thinking about the thinking of right? How we put ourselves in the situation, how we're going to deal with it. And I think that is where big history can offer perhaps the best starting point. Uh, but in order to do all these things, I think we need some wise merchants, right? People who are willing to sponsor us, get us going, and hopefully produce good solutions. So in some, I would think, there is a bright future for it. There's really a lot we can do. But we need to work hard to make it happen. And we are willing to openly discuss all these aspects in the most open way. And I was so happy that that happened yesterday evening. We cannot leave our happy end. Uh, uh, so to achieve our best possible understanding of the history. And Yes, that is our goal, right? And they've come a long way, really a long way. So I think with your energy, intelligence, and perseverance, we'll make it happen. Thank you so much. For your time. which I think summarised beautifully where we've come from, where we are now, and a really exciting, positive glimpse of where we might be going, Fred. So I found that really reassuring, really heartening, and really optimistic, and I personally I thank you for it very much. I'm sure we'll all